Hi everyone. Can I, I don't know if there's a way that you guys can hear. I'm so by the way, I'm Zena. I'm the director of the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice. Um, thank you guys so much for um, joining during this little session here. Um, are you guys maybe if everyone can just sort of type into the chat just so I know that you guys are there and sort of able to hear us. If you even if you just want to type in hi and and your name, that would be great. And then I'm Cherish Forster. I'm the program advisor for the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice. So I am going to be your contact point for anything related to the school um, programming, that kind of thing. So feel free okay. to reach out to me anytime. So okay. Basically, what we're going to do today is just um, we're here. We know that you've re you've viewed the um, you viewed the DYU um, and the program plans and. All of the information that we had put up and we hope that some of that was um, useful for you guys. Um, it's not the traditional way that we would normally do this session. Uh, normally you know we'd have uh, like Evan up on the stage talking and the from Justice Association there and all of our faculty so it's a little bit unique for us as well. Um, so but we're hoping that at least in the PowerPoint you still got a little bit of information that we would have presented to you in that. Um, so what we're thinking today was that rather than just regurgitate all of that information to you guys again, is that we would um, just open up the floor and let you guys ask questions and then um, and then we can answer them. And then hopefully you're not the only one with that question and and uh, you help uh, answer something for someone else. So so who <laughs> wants to be the first one to, to ask a question? <laughs> Maybe I can just say while you guys are trying to figure that out or trying to formulate a question, like we are excited about having you guys join us in the fall. So um, if you guys sort of read through um, the stuff that was posted, um, our faculty and our staff are just, um, we love working um, with students and sort of engaging with students. So please don't, when you, you know, if you're able to come out into campus in the fall, um, don't hesitate and stop by the A building, which is where CRIM is located come by, say hi, um, just pop your head in to introduce yourself. It's sort of, it's nice just to put a face to a name. Um, and if we can't, and we're sort of doing everything remote, um, then just don't hesitate to reach out to Cherish. Um, you can also just email me directly if you just have questions about things or reach out to your professors, whoever your instructors are, um, you know, and ask questions not about the course, but just generally about the program. And if you have any of those sorts of things, we're more than happy to um, just answer them. And our door is, Sort of always open so yeah the faculty are are amazing and they will uh they just want to see you succeed so don't ever feel like you're going it alone just make sure that you um if you have questions there's no question that shouldn't be asked so go to them and and they will they will help you through it right so email um, ask to go in on a virtual call everybody's trying to be as flexible as they can with this semester make sure that we're all there to support you guys because it's a big transition um, coming in. So we got one here for the Bachelor in Criminal Justice degree. Which courses uh, do you recommend we register for the first semester? Um, okay, so basically if you're brand brand new to the university and depending on how many classes you want to take, um, your first semester in the diploma or the degree would be courses um, CRIM 100, uh, CRIM 103, CRIM 129. And then um, we would recommend that you take, if you want to take a full course load, like five course load, then you would take, you know, Sociology 101, Psychology 102, or Political Science 110, two of the three in there to kind of give you a five course load. Most students are taking, you know, anywhere between three and four courses. And I know probably in this semester there may be even less courses being taken just as you adapt to the online, which is totally fine and understandable. So, sorry, um, I got noise in the background. Um, so with, um, with that, what you would do is you would focus on 129, that be your key um, course. That, if nothing else, that is the course that you take this semester. And then you could build in 100, 103, or 100 and SOS 101, or you want to balance it out. If you don't want to be all CRIM related courses, then add in one of those other general education requirements. You'll see in the plan that was included in the PowerPoint, 
um, that there's a list of general education requirements. So that's where Sociology 101, Psychology 102, Political Science 110, your English communications requirements, they all fall in. So you'll be using those, uh, using that plan to kind of um, build on your, on your program. So taking those intro type courses in your first semester will kind of start that foundation building so that when you progress into the second year come next fall, then you're, um, you're ready for those classes that are a little bit more um, in depth rather than being le like less introductory. So if nothing else, 129 and then 100, 103. And if you want to go for like four or five classes, then throw in a psych, SOS or political science. And that would be for both, both programs. And, you know, know that there is summer semester. So if you want to take a bit of a smaller, lighter load this fall, you can catch up in that summer semester. So don't feel like you're, you know, you're going to be behind or anything like that. And quite honestly, most of the students that I see now are working or are going to school, um, like going to school, working and volunteering or in sports or, you know, raising families or whatever the case may be. And um, they just can't do five, four or five courses a semester. So they will, um, uh, you know, you'll be, you know, most kind of finish in a four and a half, five year time frame or two, two and a half year if they're doing the diploma. So don't feel like it's a race against the clock. You don't have to be done. Um, you just have to go at the pace that works for you. Um, so somebody, uh, Noah asked where the uh, PowerPoint is. So that actually was as part of the uh, Discovery or UFE that you would have done to get to the login for the session that you're in today. So that you may have bypassed that step, but if you go back to the Discovery or UFE um, webpage, uh, you should be able to find it under the program's information. And if you can't find it, send me an email and I'll track it down for you. Any other questions? The timetable comes out tomorrow. Oh, I got another question. Oh, thanks. Okay. You're welcome. So, um, timetable comes out tomorrow. Um, uh, I assume that they hope to have it live in the morning, but, you know, if you don't see it first thing, just check back in the afternoon. Um, it will look a little bit different than it normally does, just in the sense of obviously there's no classrooms, uh, no times necessarily associated with your classes, that kind of thing. Um, when you're looking at the timetable, you want to make sure that you are mindful that there aren't any specific times that you have to be online or come online for an exam. Um, so you want to make sure that you're reading all of the course information for that specific course. Um, I can say for the CRIM courses that you would be looking at, there aren't any required times, um, but you will be looking at, um, you know, you'll be looking at maybe psych or SOS or English, and they may have some required time. So you want to make sure that you don't um, miss uh, a time that you're supposed to be in with your classmates. So uh, just review that. Um, there are some really good videos on the registration website. If you go to the, uh, I'll, I can type it into the message board here. Um, and if you scroll to the bottom of the page, they have a how to register. And you can watch the videos on what the screens are going to look like when you go in, what numbers they you need for that. So the, what the, what is a course reference number or a CRN? What does that do? How you know what what do you need to use? Um, so that will be um, a really good starting point so that you know what to prepare for when you go to register at the beginning of July. So registration times will also be out tomorrow. So same thing, you'll log into your MyUFE account, that information will be there. If it's not up in the morning, check back in the afternoon and they, you know, be able, it should be uploaded at that point. You'll be fairly early in the registration period because as brand new first year students, you always register up in the first week. So be prepared that you'll probably register around the fourth or so, maybe a little bit before, maybe a little bit after. Um, and then you have to log in at your time. Um, you can't go in any earlier. The system won't allow you. And you have to make sure that your $200 deposit is paid prior to your registration time so that they can release the registration hold so that you don't have any. Um, so I see that there is a question about what are breadth requirements. 
So breath requirements are your non-CRIM type courses that we've, we've dictated to you in your program plan. Um, they're not electives that you get to kind of choose what you want to do. They're courses that are going to um, give you foundational knowledge that will assist you through your degree. So things like your psychology, your sociology, your English communications courses, they all fall under your breadth requirements. And they serve purpose within your degree to kind of expand that knowledge base, but also help you within your CRIM courses. So very specific in what each program builds into their um, breadth requirements. So for instance, in our, in our breadth, we have business 203. So if you're doing the CRIM degree, you would do organizational behavior. And you're, you specifically do that course because a lot of you will be going off to work in organizations. So to understand how they function and that kind of thing is an important piece. So um, when you see breadth requirements in any program, um, they're, they're built in there to, to um, assist you through your program and assist you as you move on to your careers, giving you that foundational knowledge that you need. On your actual Ed, like your program audit that you're going to see on your My UFE and what I would send you if you ask for it, it's actually going to refer to them as general education requirements, but they are all the same thing. So, um, so what was that question there? Does the diploma, sorry, my things, uh, yes, so yes, it does. Um, the first two years of the degree is the diploma, um, with the exception of the two physical fitness courses. So you do um, CRIM 201 and then one of 202 or 203. Those are our physical fitness courses. They are um, kind of like preparatory classes for those who are looking into going into policing corrections, border service, that kind of thing, to uh, get you to meet the physical attribute tests of, uh, of those uh, careers. The, um, the other courses that you would take as part of the program, they all carry over into the degree. So if you were to start off in the diploma and change your mind and go to the degree or do the diploma and go away and come back, then those courses will then move into your degree and your first years are done and you would just pick up from where you left off. Um, if you haven't paid your deposits yet, you guys should do that shortly um, because you usually pay through your uh, banking, uh, through your bank, sorry, and um, it can take a couple days for that to roll over. So you just want to make sure that whatever you're doing, um, you know, is done and in the system so there's no delay when you go to register for your classes. Um, your, you can pay by debit visa if you have one of the accepted ones that's all listed on the site when you go to pay, um, but it's sometimes a lot easier just to set UFE up like a bill on your banking and then you just pay your uh, tuition or your deposits that way. Um, and then that way, uh, you don't have to line up when, I mean, this semester is going to be a little different, but you don't have to line up on fee payment because UFE doesn't take a uh, credit card for that anymore. So, um, so the web banking seems to have been the best way to move in that direction now. So, um, so that's one of the big things is making sure that's paid up. Um, if you are, if you think you paid it or you're not sure if you paid it, um, you can look on your My UFE account under student information and then under your billing and you'll be able to see that you have a credit on your account and then you know that you're okay to go for registration. So that one's a really important one because that's the one that gets forgotten a lot. And then it's panic mode. And this time because we're all off campus, it's not as easy as just running into the reg office necessarily and paying. So we want to make sure that everybody's covered. So. So nobody wanted to answer your question, Zena? No. <laughs> is there are people Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, are people familiar with generally sort of the program and understanding? So um, what makes, I think, criminology um, unique is we have practicums um, that give you that opportunity to just um, test your feet, um, get a sense of the kinds of career options that are out there. And so you are able to sort of in your second year, um, if you meet the prerequisites, and then again, in your fourth year, if you're doing your degree, you um, get the opportunity to do two practicum placements. And so, um, you know, start thinking, I know it's a little bit early now, but certainly start thinking about maybe some areas where you know, you might, whatever your future job or career might want to be, and our um, career development coordinator can work with you to try and sort of find you a placement that suits um, what it is. Ooh, that's a good question. 
There's lots of um yes. There's a lot of different options for for practicum. Um pretty much if you can think it then there's probably something that we have or something that even Kim's willing to go out and look for um within reason obviously. Um but you know there's a a number of practicums like within police and corrections um and then within our not community nonprofits and that kind of thing. But um, we do have um, some with CVSE, you know, the, you know, the guys you see on the side of the road checking the trucks and um, we have conservation and bylaw and various levels of government. Um, so it, there's a little bit of something for everybody, um, whether you want to work with barriered adults or at risk youth or, um, you want to do something completely different um, and you want to do kind of like security screening or or you want to do security as a as something as a as a career like there's a lot of different options and as you're moving through your courses you're going to learn about different um, aspects of the system that you maybe didn't even know existed um, and so I've had a lot of students who are like you know they come in a, and I want to be a cop I want to be a cop and that's what they want to be and then they take a couple of courses and they're like actually what I wanted to do was this but I thought I had to do this to get there so you will find as you're taking these intro classes and you have guest speakers coming in and you're talking with your sessionals who are um, you know, practitioners in the field, um, that you're going to learn a lot about the different areas. But um, Kim Nichol is our career development coordinator, and she um, has some amazing connections. I think we usually have about 100 different kind of placement opportunities um, throughout the year, give or take, depending on um, how many, you know, um, students need practicum. We have about 50 two different um, contact points. And some of those contacts will have multiple different layers of practicum. Um, but that's just showing just how how many connections she has um, in that field of um, for practicum related to criminology. And they're not all like, you know, you wouldn't always look at them and think that is a crim specific practicum. But sometimes there's people who want to be more on, you know, the, the uh, restorative side or they want to be more on the you know so it's not like you're not always thinking I'm going to have to be in corrections or I'm always going to have to be in policing or I only have to be something that's working within the government you have a lot of other opportunities there so well I think related to that there was a question about are there practicums in courtrooms um, I think certainly I don't know if I've specifically heard of being placed like within the courtroom but many of the agencies that we work with because of the types of clients that you end up working with um, you'll naturally may involve um, sometimes either escorting or maybe doing some of that maybe preparatory work so not directly in the courtroom but as a result of the kinds of clients that you're working with um, there may be some opportunities that are there but if you sort of had an idea I think and you know it was um, far enough in advance I certainly think that our career like him could so probably look into into something like that. Yeah, and we had um, some placement, we've had students placed with uh, First Nations Court, um, and so they were um, not necessarily always in the classroom, much like what Zena is saying, where they were pre preparing work, uh, paperwork and that kind of thing, but there were opportunities for them to go to court and um, and sit in on sessions for specific clients and that kind of thing, because that was a very unique placement because there's a lot more of a closer connection in that sense. So there was that and parole board and probation and stuff like that would have those opportunities to expose you to that kind of, um, you know, environment, um, not necessarily always in the courtroom, but to bring you to that point. So, um, so it says, how will courses look for the fall since it's online? Will there be video class or would it look differently? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to take the lead on that one? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. So um, what the university has been encouraging and what we've decided to do in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice is, um, so first and foremost, by the way, we do want to ensure we're working really hard to make sure that, um, you know, that your online experience is just the same sort of quality and engagement and, and connecting to your instructors as you would if you were in class. And so um, I don't know how familiar people are with the different terms, but Within the School of Chronology, we will be running courses um, asynchronously. So asynchronously means that 
you are not required to um, be present. There's no set day and time that you have to log in because there's a lecture going on or something like that. Um, however, that doesn't mean that you should never log in and sort of do things when you want. It's a good idea to maybe set aside a day and, and, and you know, make a schedule for yourself where information to get a sense of when information will be released. So instructors will do things um, a little bit differently. Some people might um, release information and the course content every week, once a week. Other people might do it in um, like blocks or chunks of material. So maybe they might do, I don't know, like three weeks at a time, or maybe even sort of the first half of the semester, the first six weeks, and then the next six weeks of the semester. So um, instructors will vary a little bit in terms of what they can do. So some of, for example, our summer instructors um, do do sort of like these short video um, type sessions. But if you can't join at that particular day and time because you have other obligations, those sessions are recorded and you can view them at a later time um, that's convenient for you. So where none of the courses are going to be such that you have to log in at a specific day and time, but that also means that um, it's a good idea to try to figure out maybe a schedule that works for you just to be consistent and so that you're staying connected to your instructor. So there's a question about will the final exam be online? So it does depend on how the instructor has chosen to do that. So the university does have a set final exam period, which will run um, around mid-December. But many of our instructors also just do exams um, sort of, you know, within across the 13-week the semester. Those exams, yes, will be online and um, Instructions will be given in terms of where do I look, how do I log in, how much time do I have, all of that will vary a little bit from instructor to instructor and from course to course. So when you, always really important when you get your syllabus and when you register for a course, make sure to read through that instructor's um, outline in their syllabus, which will give you all the details about um, readings and deadline dates, um, so you can plan your schedule to figure out oh, I know I have an exam, you know, three weeks from now, or I have an assignment due five weeks from now. So those things will all be laid out once you get your course syllabus. And the exam, the final exam um, schedule is released a month after uh, classes start. Um, so you won't actually know that information for somebody who is holding a final exam in the exam period. You'll know um, in the first week, whether or not there's going to be an exam in the final exam period, and then you know to check um, uh, when the final exam schedule comes out for your date and time. Now, that may be cut, like, and it, this would be for any semester, um, your final exam is not always held on the day that your course would normally run or open or whatever. So when we're back to traditional in-class sessions, you may be taking a class, you know, Tuesday at uh, 10 o'clock um, from 10 till 12.50, but your exam might actually be like, two, you know, Wednesday at 8.30 or something like that. So it just depends on how the scheduling works. So that's just something to keep in mind. This, of course, is a little bit different because there isn't necessarily days that you're going to be online, um, but you just have to be mindful that your final exam day, you do, you do have to be online for that. And if there is some sort of reason that you absolutely can't be, that needs to be discussed with the instructor um, right away um, so that that can be dealt with. There's usually, um, you know, if there is a, overlap in you've ended up being double booked for final exam, then there's a conflict block that we could then shift one or the other to. Um, but when that exam period uh, calendar comes out, it's usually with enough notice that you should be able to make sure that you're available for it. And for, um, for Brady with the courtroom stuff, um, I don't know how it's going to work. Uh, it won't, it won't be something that you're going to worry about this semester, but down the road, um, depending on um, who you take for criminal law, um, he Simon Thompson is one of the instructors who teaches that class, and he does do a um, like a field trip in a sense where you guys go and sit in on court case for a couple hours and and kind of post your reflections. Part of an assignment, um, one of the uh, options for an assignment. So there is some opportunity to get into the to the courtroom and and see uh, a trial in progress. Um, and he usually tells you which ones and where 
um, those can be done. So um, if you end up taking him, then that might be something you get to do there. Are you are you law school bound, Brady? Because um, there are some um, practicums where um, you won't necessarily be in the courtroom, but uh, Kim has some that work with law offices. Oh, personal injury. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So there are some um, some placements that she has. Most of them tend to be for the fourth year because they, they kind of want to know that you're you're ready to go and ready to head off to law school. Um, but you have that opportunity to do a placement within a law firm. And so uh, when that time comes, like beyond Kim's radar, they're usually um, competitive and there's because there's not as many of them. And there's usually a few of you that want to go off to law school. So uh, make it known that you want to do that. <laughs> um, no. Yes. It is not. So, um, I, we cannot run the physical fitness courses uh, due to the social distancing requirements. Um, so uh, if, if you're in a situation that you were going to be complete your program this um, fall, then we would have a workaround for that. But for anybody who is just starting or is, you know, just partway through, um, you'll have to push your fitness courses to the winter when we're hopefully back on campus. So there's a, there's a question about what's a recommendation, I guess. Is it CRIM 129 over CRIM 100 or 103? Um, yeah, yes. <laughs> I would say yes. Um, if, you're, or if you're looking to only take one class this semester, then 129 doesn't give you that same kind of um, CRIM focus in, this, in a traditional CRIM class. In the in the way of like looking at the justice system from from that way or at, at the theories, um, but it would be a really good way to prepare you for the success in the program going forward. Um, for your if you're taking a couple courses, I would say you do 129 and then pick one of 100 or 103. Do you want to talk to them about? opportunities for research with the center and stuff as they move through their program or yeah I can always say that so I think that um, I know that we already mentioned a little bit about the practicums that make um, criminology unique but I think that one of the other things that um, we sort of take a lot of pride in within the school is you have a lot of opportunities just to do applied work and applied research and so we have um, it's sort of more a virtual center. I guess there's no physical space. We have a center for public safety and criminal justice research. And so um, that's headed by Dr. Erwin Cohen. And so we have a lot of students who just get involved. It is paid research assistant work working on a lot of different kinds of projects. Uh, so in policing and sort of fire safety, generally public safety, um, we've done things um, like gambling research, um, public satisfaction surveys in terms of policing. And so one of the nice things, I know that there's a couple of you, or at least one of you here is interested in um, law school. Um, and I know that people typically think, oh, if I wanna to go to law school, I need experience either in a courtroom or something like that. But one of the biggest things that um, is particularly helpful for law school is research skills, because that is a lot of what you have to do as a lawyer is being able to research case law, being able to read it, digest it, um, put it into a written format that you present, um, you know, either on behalf of your client or when you're presenting that in front of a judge. So getting some research skills through either our center or you could do that as part of a directed study. So we have lots of opportunities where you could, um, a project of interest to you, um, you can work together with a faculty member who can support you and mentor you through that process. And um, you can produce something that, um, you know, is a research report that somebody, an agency might be interested in reading, or you can gain some of those skills. Um, and we also have an honors program that if you wanted to do that more in depth, um, you could be able to look at that. But we have lots of um, experiences, so don't ever hesitate, reach out. I know, don't feel like you need to have really any background knowledge. One of the ways that you can get yourself familiar with either the system or just understanding what happens in some of these agencies is doing things like some of the research with them. That way then you understand sort of who's involved, um, what different people do, what are their responsibilities, and sort of then looking at some of that research in that way. Um, so there was a question about... Um, any specific important information for high school graduates? 
Um, I guess I, maybe I would throw that back out in terms of are there things that you're worried about just transitioning in terms of sort of the high school to um, university? If that's sort of what you're looking at, then I would say that certainly um, I think for many people and this is not meant to scare you. It's just uh, like think about it. And it's important to sort of organize yourself and plan um, for a lot of people. The transition from high school to first year university is probably quite eye opening. Um, I think in many good ways, by the way, that doesn't mean it's a it's a bad thing. I think you have the freedom to, in many cases, take a lot of courses that are of interest to you and things that you might um, want to work towards as part of your eventual career. And so I would say take that opportunity to explore. We've got lots of things, not just within criminology, but interesting courses within criminology, within the College of Arts. Um, if you think that um, there's something that might complement what you're studying in criminology, we have a lot of students who take things in psychology, in sociology, in political science, um, I think even history. <laughs> business um, because they feel like they want to meld the two of those together. And so um, what I would say is um, keep yourself organized. Um, one of the things that's really different from high school compared to first year university is um, just a little bit more independence in terms of you're probably not going to have not all instructors are going to be sort of on you right now um, saying, hey, get this stuff in. You'll have deadlines. You'll need to organize yourself. And part of actually CRIM 129, which is why we recommend doing that in that first semester, is to help you sort of figure out what's my learning style? Um, what are some uh, good study habits? Um, how do I organize myself? Those things are going to be really, really important um, to set you up for success. And just really generally, I would say communicate with your professors and your instructors. Like reach out to Cherish, reach out to myself, reach out to your instructors. Like she said, no question um, is a, any sort of a weird question or a strange question to ask. Um, ask it um, because we're really here to sort of help and support you. And so make sure that you are staying connected with your instructors, even if it means just I don't understand what I just read in the textbook or, you know, I don't understand what's going on here. We're more than happy to help you. And so I think as long as you keep that open line of communication, uh, I think he'll do really well in that first yeah. semester. And, and I think too, you like make sure that you make yourself aware of all the um, services that UFB offers. So like the Academic Success Center, um, you know, the Accessibility Center, if you need help there, counseling, all that kind of stuff. Like even though we're remote, um, there are um, there's still supports in place for you guys. So you want to make sure that you're taking advantage of those as well because they will help. Um, with your success um, and also like it's going to be a little bit trickier this time because normally you'd be in the classroom and you could kind of like connect with the the buddy that sits next to you but still try to um, I don't know try and have that piece somehow like if you want to try and start like an online study group maybe put it out to your class you know there is ways to do that you can email your group um, your entire class through the blackboard you know so so there's ways like you know if you're a little bit more extroverted maybe you're a little bit you're not shy to to do that and and some people will really be appreciative of the fact that somebody took the lead on that and and you you know develop this like little study or support group or whatever you want to do for your class so so don't forget about that piece too like that's where we're gonna really lose that this time so if we can try and like somehow build that up and I think some of the faculty will try to find ways to still connect you guys together. And I know like even we have one faculty uh, or one sessional this summer who does, or a couple of them actually that do sessions where you can pop on, you'll actually see live faces. So um, not everybody can be on there all the time, but at least it, it still gives you a visual. You can actually see who those people are. So, um, so there was a question about the difference between the criminology program and the criminal justice program. Well, we actually only have a criminal justice program. We are the school of criminology and criminal justice because our program encompasses both worlds. Um, but um, your program specifically here would be criminal justice. So you would have a bachelor of arts in criminal justice or a criminal justice diploma. Criminology is um, the study of the crim of crim theories. Uh, Zena could probably speak way, way more to that than I can. And criminal justice is, um, 
is what we're looking at when we're looking at the system as a whole, uh, how it functions, how things progress through. So um, our degree is very specific in the fact that you you get both. You get to you learn about those theories and it melds together with what practices happen out in the actual field, why these theories are important for what, why we need those theories for, for what happens in the field too. So yeah. but I'll so leave that What Cher said is, yeah, exactly true. I think like we, um, very much one of the things that we like to promote about our program is that you get sort of the criminology part, um, which is sort of the study of crime and all the different systems, the courts, corrections, policing, social service agencies, you know, all of those kinds of things and the various different um, players are involved, right? So judges, correctional officers, parole officers, probation, um, victims, offenders, we come at it from all angles. And so that's just the criminology part in terms of just the academic study. And we also pride ourselves on being sort of the criminal justice part, which is sort of the applied. So you would take all of that information, the concepts that you're learning in class and being able to apply them. And so one way you do that is to practicums. But another way is just um, we have a lot of sessionals, for example, who are practitioners within the field. You get exposed to what does, you know, you can read about something that talks about in an academic way what research says. And then what does that translate like in practice when you go out into an agency and you're working with these populations? And how do you take that information and actually apply it? Because that's um, what's really important at the end of the day. We want you guys to be able to take that and um start to sort of uh, make changes within the system for the better. And so I think that um, even though we're called the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice, I think Cherish is right. I guess on officially it is a criminal justice either degree or diploma. Yeah. yeah. But with both. And yes, I agree. It's, I, I imagine it's very hard for you guys right now with the schools yeah. and all that kind of stuff because you don't have your normal resources to go to. So that's why you can still reach out to us, like even after today's session, you know, if you have questions or you have concerns, you can send an email, you know, to me or to Zena or to both of us. Um, you can book an appointment with me. Um, a lot of students will do a check in, you know, once before they register each semester or some prefer only to pop in once a year. Some kind of do check in through email throughout the year and then do, uh, you know, one sit down, you know, closer to moving into second year, third year, fourth year, you know, it's whatever works for you guys um, and you feel comfortable with. I have some, like I say, that I see on a very regular basis or get uh, communication from on a regular basis and some that cross the stage and I never, never ever saw them. So it happens, but, um, but we're here just to support you. So just don't feel like you have, now we're going into summer that we're going to disappear and whatever. You're going to have questions as we get closer to um, the semester starting. Um, things will just pop into your head and be like, oh, but what about this? What about that? Just send us an email. We're here for the summer. We're here available for that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. That's a question. Good so how, yeah, so the question is, how can you be successful in this program? I think there's lots of ways of defining success and what you do. And I think part of that is sort of what do you want to get out of the program, right? And so um, I think it always helps. I think just as you guys are all sort of transitioning, think about sort of um, your learning style. Think about what works for you um, and sort of how you learn best, because that is always helpful to know if you have a little bit of that awareness of like, oh, either I need things to be really organized for myself or um, I need things to be set and to have a schedule uh, that's sort of helpful to know. Um, I think if success for you means that I am able to, you know, finish my degree or finish my diploma and I want to get employable skills, that's exactly I would argue what we can do. I think that if you come ready and just being open to learning and communicating with your instructors and being proactive, reaching out, uh, when you have questions that are, I think those are some of the big things that you um, can do to set yourself up to do really well in the program. I'd say always ask, keep asking questions. Um, never stop doing that. Even once you sort of leave university and get out there. Um, Cause that is one of the most important ways that you're going to learn and trying to take away from a class, you know, what are the things that I need to understand? Um, that will be really, really helpful in just sort of making sure that you keep on track, um, sticking to deadlines and those kinds of things, those will all be helpful.
Deadlines is a big thing. That's a that's one of the biggest um, shockers to I think first year students. <laughs> Depending on how rigorous your school that you're coming from was about deadlines, but some have a bit more of a freer approach. And and it was you know as long as you had everything done by June, you were good. It doesn't work that way. See, and that's usually where um, I get the panic. Like oh, I missed a I missed a deadline, and I thought it would be okay that I had submitted it a few days late, but that is not the case. So. So yeah, definitely schedule yourself. 129 is really good for that. It's going to teach you um, a lot about like just yourself, uh, writing, um, academic planning, uh, kind of like study, uh, like kind of how to figure out what your best way for studying is, um, time management, which is a huge one because um, that's where I think the reality is like if you're taking three classes, it's, it's essentially like having a little part time job because the amount of hours that you put into your schoolwork plus your homework and any research that you do above that, you have to think like that's going to be uh, it's going to take a significant amount of hours a week. So and then being online um, may take you a little bit longer because you may want to read through every, you know, every post that everybody's made and and I would encourage that because that's how you get to see how that's going to um, how that's going to work for you within within those classes right so uh like how how everything's coming together or questions that may be being asked that you, maybe you hadn't thought of and then there's responses you know um so I always I always encourage people when they're taking online classes in a in a, just a normal capacity um that they they really embrace themselves and that give themselves the time with it you know maybe log in try and go in every day if you have to if, if it's a fairly active um, forum discussion based course because then you don't have to go on and spend four hours reading through every single uh, post you can actually go on and respond and not have to now think about new things to say because your idea was already talked about so um, so those are kind of important things to to think but but 129 will definitely help you guys with that um, helping you kind of prepare for that so it would be really good um, so are there multiple crim 120 yes yeah so for 100 and 103 I think we're running seven or eight sections of those. I think so, something like that. Um, so there will be, some will be taught by the same professors um, and then, you know, a couple sections or whatever, but there will be uh, multiple uh, options there. And 129, we have four sections. Three are being taught by one and one is being taught by another. So, but they're all awesome and amazing. So, you know, it's, you can't go wrong in that. Um, and then will there be optional drop-ins at all? So what did you mean by that? Are you referring to courses or like advising, I guess? So advising in a traditional format, um, I would be in my office and you could just wander by my door and grab me um, as long as I wasn't with somebody. Um, so that's kind of how I, how I am. My door's open all the time. You can come. Um, come by sometimes you know I have students who are just on their way to another class and so they come by and just want to pop in and ask me a quick question because they're already there the same goes with the faculty um, same thing if they're in their office and they're able to speak to you they will um, sometimes they're there they have specific office hours for a specific class and may say that you have to come at another time but um, but most people are when we're on campus doors open because we're not on campus right now, um, we're I'm we're doing phone appointments or by email. So the drop-in essentially would be an email like this at this point. So you would just send me an email, and then I could we could go back and forth that way. And then if you had further questions or it would make more sense to maybe chat on the phone, then we would just proceed with booking an appointment. But usually we can kind of get the quick questions done over email. Um, but for drop-ins for class, it's going to depend on the instructor themselves. So they may say, like, I have a virtual office hour Tuesdays from 11 to 12. And so you could just pop in there, chat with them, and then pop out. Some might create, like, a kind of what they're doing this semester where they have a little, like, mini lecture session where they maybe talk about a topic or something to do with that week. And then you guys can pop in if you're available. So... 
so when's the last day to register for courses? Um, so, so usually what happens is you could actually like register for a course into the first week if there's still room. Um, and then even if an instructor is giving you permission, like say on the Friday of the first week, you could still register on the Monday. It's not a problem. Um, where you'll start to get um, pushback is once fees have been paid and then you have to have uh, like department head late permission. So it would actually have to come through Zena and I's office and then we would look at that, whether or not permission, because you don't want to come in too late because then you have to really play catch up. And um, sometimes that's hard because you may have missed some very specific information in those first couple of weeks. But you don't want to. So CRIM is a fairly high demand program. So it's important to register for your courses at your registration time. You could always register and then withdraw from them. Um, but to make sure and ensure that you have a good course offering and to get the courses that you want to take, you should register at your time because they, um, you might not run into it, you may not experience it so much in your 100 level classes, but when you move up into second, third, and fourth year, where there's less option for those actual courses per semester, you don't want to leave, uh, you don't want to be late on your reg time and then find out you can't get your classes. Yes. So yeah, so the question is, will all Chrome classes be, will be delivered online with no need to be in attendance at the time of the class? Any video sessions will be recorded and viewable later? Yes, so generally, yes, that is. What I do want to say though is, it is very much instructor dependent in terms of how they choose to deliver the material. So you may not necessarily get a video lecture in every single class because there's multiple ways that um, information can be um, sort of taught. And so we have lots of people who do very different things like um, it may be like short little assignments or reading things and commenting on them um, or even having to do sort of like little activities after reading a particular chapter to help you understand the material. So don't um, come in. I would, um, if I think that we were all sort of in person, you probably would get more of the sort of lecture style type of class. But with things being online, mm -hmm. what we have to be careful about is um, the ability of our actual online platform to be able to actually house a video that is really um, long in length. And also people have varying sort of internet and equipment capabilities. So we will do our best to sort of um, provide sort of what we can, but again, it will be instructor dependent. But yes, we have been giving the, um, sort of recommendation that whatever, um, you know, if students can't come on a particular day, because you guys certainly have um, other things going on, things will be recorded and uploaded to be able to be accessed. So yeah. I mean, I think one thing I should maybe go back and also say, just as we're sort of um, ending this sort of session is because we're going online, I think one of the important things really is um, communication is just so important. You're just going to have to do a lot of written communication because it's not just emailing back and forth, but when you're doing discussion posts, that really is going to be your primary way that you're going to be communicating with um, myself, with Cherish, um, with any of your instructors. And so just being able to express yourself so that um, we know um, what you're asking us, because that's the best way that we can help you. And that's the best way your instructors can help you is making sure that um, you communicate your questions clearly. Um, and if it takes a little bit of back and forth, that's OK. Um, I know some instructors have opted to do virtual office hours, so don't hesitate to connect with someone over video conference. Um, I find for myself that helps um, just to put a face to a name, too. So. Um, I think don't be, uh, you know, it might take some used to, uh, getting used to in terms of just being comfortable in a video platform. So if you wanted to start off just doing um, email communications and doing those kinds of things, that's great. But yes, it's, I think that one thing that'll be different this fall than others is just um, making sure that you do stay connected um, so that we don't sort of lose you. Um, and, and we wanna make sure that we set you up for the next semester as well. Yeah. And one really important thing, um, make sure that you're using your MyUFE email. Um, log into that. Um, faculty, if they're uh, corresponding with you, will email you through your MyUFE email or your student email account. Um, if you're emailing instructors, you should be using your 
um, your student email account because sometimes things happen and we get a uh, spam filter and it can, it's the weirdest thing sometimes because somebody can email me from their Hotmail account and then the next day they've sent me something else and it's got caught. So we kind of get um, lost in that. But just try to use that and also like be sure to check it while you're, um, you know, when you're in classes and stuff. Because if, if I'm communicating with you um, through our main channels or if um, your faculty, your, your instructor is going to be communicating with you, it's going to be through those channels. Um, and also as a note, because um, the system is a little bit interesting, but um, if you email somebody in Blackboard, so you email from within your class, it actually emails to your, like only to the Blackboard and so you will not see those emails in your student email account, even though it's still coming through your student email account, but it's only situated in that course. So if you have an instructor, for instance, who said, I want you to email me your assignment on, at 11, by 11.59 on October 10th or whatever, then you have to make sure that you have clarified that email is through the student email system, not through the Blackboard system, because they may not receive it and then it will be seen as a late assignment or whatever the case may be. So just, it's always good if you're not, if it's not clear how to communicate with your instructors, just to confirm with them. And I can guarantee you're not the only one with that question. So reach out to them and, and ask, because we're all kind of new to this right now. We're all learning. Um, we, we've done things over a virtual platform and email that we've never had to do before. So, um, so we're all learning and we, and so any kind of feedback of like, Hey, that wasn't very clear is really good for us. Right. So, but just make sure that you're doing that. If you absolutely can't send, like if you're having an issue with the Zimbra system, the student information system, then you can send an email through your personal account and just say, listen, until I can get this resolved, this is the system I'm going to be doing. But just know if you haven't heard back in a couple days, you might want to check in again because it's likely that our spam filter has grabbed it. So when in doubt, always use your, in, you know, your student system uh, for communication purposes. Um, the question about when schedules are posted, are the profs indicated? Uh, yes. So um, you'll see a schedule and it'll show like the different sections. And so usually you'll see because everything is online, it'll be like CRIM 100, ON1, CRIM 100, ON2. Um, and then there'll be an instructor name listed uh, next to each class. Yeah. And that's going to come out tomorrow. Um, and then, uh, like, I, like I had said before, it will be a little bit different than um, Lennon if you've looked back at like an archive timetable or something, because there are no classrooms assigned to things, everything is section ON1 or ON2 or ON3. Um, whereas in a traditional semester, you'd be looking at, um, you know, AB1, which is Abbotsford, you know, and then if it was like AB1, AB2, AB3, AB4, that means there's four sections in Abbotsford. And then there would be like CH1 and MI1 telling you that you're in Chilliwack or Mission. So you make the decision, do I want to be on the Abbey campus? Do I want to be in Chilliwack? Do I want to be in Mission? Or do I want to take the online section if there is one? So that's something that's going to be different about this semester is everything is going to be like ON1, ON2, you know, that kind of thing. Um, there is a reference number that's assigned to each specific course. So ON1 will have its own reference number. In the fall, it always starts with a nine. In the summer, it always starts with a five. And in the winter, it always starts with a one. Um, and it's five digits. And that's how the computer knows which section of the course that you want. So if you were looking for a specific instructor, for instance, then you would look for that instructor in that, and then you would take that, um, that section. But, um, but a lot of the time, uh, generally what happens is when we're on campus, a lot of students are looking for what fits into their schedule. So, um, you know, I can do classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so that's what they're looking for. So that's a little bit different this semester, but that will all be on um, on the timetable tomorrow. Um, and then if you watch the registration videos, they'll talk about, you know, what each piece of the timetable means. So this course reference number, or as you'll see it written a lot is CRN, um, that is the reference number that assigns to that course. So they know I want to take, you know, CRIM 104 with, you know, Erwin Cohen or whatever the case may be. So. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, we're sort of at the end. I don't know if there are, anyone has any sort of last minute questions or things. Because I know it's just a, not the only one. Yeah, I know it's a small group, but we appreciate you sort of like at Thank least you. joining and we sort of get to see some names of some people that are coming in. So that's always very, very nice. Um, but don't certainly don't hesitate to just reach out. Um, and as Chair said, like, we don't go missing over the summer. Um, and so like reach out, ask those questions as you're getting closer, trying to figure out your registration, what you should, um, what might be a good idea to take. Um, we're all, that's what we're here for. So yeah. yeah. And feel free, like um, now that we've, we're getting closer to registration beginning and table coming uh, live, um, I'm starting to see more bookings happening in my calendar. So um, feel free to book an appointment and then we can just like have more in depth of just a chat if, if the bigger form is not comfortable for you. Um, and then we can kind of talk about what that looks like. Plus the, uh, you know, the, the class sizes are, or sorry, the, um, the class timetable will be out and we can actually like look at it and go, uh, go through it a little bit more in depth because right now anybody that I'm seeing we we don't have it we have a list of what's going to be offered but we don't really have like what sections how many sections is there any specific time you know that kind of thing so we're um so going forward from here on out it will be a little bit easier if you have specific questions when you're looking at the table um okay so, so there's one final question of what classes, classes? um so for a First year uh, class, um, we're looking at usually about 36 students per class. Some instructors will take extra students, it just depends. And because we're online, um, so, like spatially, it's not an issue this semester to have extra students. Um, sometimes though, like in when we're in an actual classroom, the classrooms um, will only hold 36 or 38 students, so there's no extra room. Some are bigger classrooms, so they can take more students. When you're in a third year class, fourth year class are generally uh, 27 students, but that varies sometimes between the discipline and also with your, uh, let's say with uh, like communications English, for instance, they, because they're very um, writing intensive, um, we tend to have, um, I guess they're a little bit on the smaller size. So even though they're first year classes, um, they tend to be a bit of a smaller, so they may only be 25 or 27 students per, per section because they wanna be able to um, have that extra time, maybe a bit more one-on-one -on -one or in smaller group sessions where you guys can work together. So um, it does vary, but traditionally most, most classes are you know 36 or 27. Um, and then of course, when you get on campus with the actual classrooms themselves, they do vary as well. So sometimes you'll be you know 36 in a classroom that just fits 36. And sometimes you'll be in a class that's for 27, but be in a room that holds 40. It just depends on where uh, the rooming software puts you for that time of day. Okay. Yeah. If there's no other sort of last minute questions, then thank you guys for coming out. Uh, it's sort of nice to meet you as best as we can. And uh, we'll hopefully see you in the fall then. Yes. And then just find us if you need us, because that's what we're here for. And, uh, and we can help with anything that you need. So congratulations on coming in and we're excited. <laughs> And you know what, this will this will be a fun kind of semester for you. Even though it's a little bit outside of the box, it'll really allow you to um, learn a lot about yourself through this through this process. And, and I think, you know, really set you up for uh, the rest of your degree and diploma. So, yeah. All right, Great. so we'll see you guys in the fall. Thank you.